Maybe uh, should we start with a, a, a little outline of your career so far in a, in a nutshell? Right on a... There is no nutshell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Where are you working at the moment? Um, I work for a research unit at the moment that does research into the testing of languages mm. and um, I'm the listening person yeah. because there aren't very many of us around. Okay. Um, uh, but that's sort of um, not a full-time thing and um, the rest of the time I do, I do some of my own research and I do um, quite a lot of writing as well. Right, okay. Um, well, yeah, listening is probably the thing we, we want to talk about. Um, let's, let's begin with the whole thorny issue of uh, sub-skills. Um, <laughs> we were talking about a, a little bit earlier. Um, what's your view on, on the term sub-skills? Well, this is very, very problematic. I mean, there's a historical reason for all of this, that um, a lot of people in the early 80s, probably, yeah, round about then, um, got interested in the idea that skills might be divisible. Um, and that that would be a much better way of teaching them than just sort of doing our usual sort of comprehension stuff in the case of listening and reading. And um, so what they wanted to do was start labelling the components of these sub-skills. Uh, and that's where the term sub-skills came from. Mm. Um, listeners, we're, we're talking about Jack Richards in 1983, who was probably the first person to do it for listening, and did it extremely extensively uh, with two actually sets of sub-skills, one for advanced, uh, sorry, for um, EAP, right. for academic uh, listeners, and one for ordinary listening. Uh, but the, the problem with all of this was, this was just what people thought mm. um, listening consisted of. Um, and it didn't have any scientific backing, but it, was, it provided a very, very useful framework. The great thing about reading was, people took it and ran with it, and mm. they did masses of skills books in the early, late 80s, early 90s. And with listening, they didn't. Um, and uh, that was a great pity, because there was already a huge um, psychological literature um, and if they'd gone back to that they would have found that from 1965 onwards people have been investigating L1 listening mm. and um, this would have provided them with the kind of framework that they needed um, and so this was my contribution that as I have a sort of background in psychology as well as um, ELT um, I said, look, we should be using this because it's actually based upon sound research mm. rather than just doing this kind of um, guessing. Um, nothing wrong with guessing, but it was very useful at the time. But what I've tried to add is a bit of, of sort of um, rigour. Scientific so, rigour. Yeah. And the terminology, I mean, processes is something you use a lot yeah. rather than sub-skills. Is there a reason Well, it's just that? an attempt to make a distinction between processes was uh, the term that psychologists, good cognitive psychologists use. They've never gone in for sub-skills. Uh -huh. Sub-skills is very much an ELT term and I think we need to separate out the instincts of people in the 1980s and 90s, very worthy and, 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 and good, and good though they were and very useful though they were, from things that we can actually link to what we know about L1 listening, L1 reading, L1 mm. writing and L1 speaking. And that brings up, I mean, the other thing that, that often gets contrasted with or confused with uh, sub-skills or processes is uh, strategies. Um, and uh, it's a yeah. topic dear to your heart, shall we say, <laughs> yeah. uh, trying to clear up the definitions around such things. So maybe, I mean, yeah. what, what is a strategy? Well, you have to look at it this way. Um, sub-skills or stroke processes um, are things that you acquire. Uh, which are part of the learning process, okay? Uh, inevitably, this takes time, and there is a time, quite a long time, and my, my, the, the, a lot of the research that I've done suggests that it's up to about B1 plus on the European framework, when people do not handle these processes automatically, they have to put effort into it. And the most basic processes involve recognizing words and mapping from the words to words in your own vocabulary. Okay. Now, if you can't do that very well, or you have too small a vocabulary, I mean, it's partly language, it's partly skill. If you can't do it, um, as you can't up to about B1+, plus, what you're doing is actually sort of um, grasping at occasional words that you recognize, but what your um, understanding is very incomplete. 
So you have to do something to fill the gaps in your understanding. And that's why it's very important for us to distinguish between what you're trying to do long term, which is acquire these processes, mm. which we hope will be with you for the rest of your operating in English life, yeah. Yeah, um, on the one hand, and techniques that you need in order to compensate for the fact that there are gaps in what you understand. And this is traditionally what strategies were, but unfortunately people have started using the term strategies for both. Mm. And it's a little bit confusing. So essentially a strategy is something that would make up for a lack you've got. Yes, yeah, something makes up for a lack and something normally short term. There are certain strategies like guessing the meaning of words in connected speech, mm. which actually you know, <laughs> are support processes and, mm -hmm. and you might want to keep long term. But most strategies you should be able to do without by the time you start, number one, recognising words automatically, and number two, beginning to recognise chunks of words in speech. Mm. And all of this helps you to stop focusing right. on word level and um, to start thinking about what the speaker is saying, why they're saying it, and to follow lines of argument and so mm. on, which people find very, very difficult to do at lower levels of listening. Um, that idea of a, a certain level of competency in, in listening, and you, you mentioned the Common European Framework, yeah. um, which has sort of detailed breakdowns of certain areas of, of, uh, of language. I'm sure you can see where I'm going with it. <laughs> What's about uh, when it comes to listening? And is the way it's codified done in uh, a way that you would agree with, or would you have any suggestions? Well, you know, I disagree with those <laughs> things, but not really. But, but, but um, the CEFR provides very general guidelines. Um, I think it is not specific, not nearly specific enough with, 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 for listening, number one. And number two, it doesn't actually represent clearly enough the processes that are involved in listening. I've already mentioned about mm -hmm. all the stuff that we've got mm -hmm. from cognitive psychologists going back to the 1960s. The CEFR was not designed um, for testing purposes. It was actually simply designed as descriptively. And the way it was put together, and I think most people know this, was that a group of very experienced teachers and teacher trainers got together and they used effectively the framework that people always had in mm. private language schools, which was beginners, elementary, lower intermediate, upper intermediate, yeah. lower advanced and advanced. And that's what became the CFR. And they exchanged views on um, uh, what they thought was typical of people at those levels. But this was not always entirely systematic in the case of listening, so that you will occasionally come across words like very or quite, mm. which are extremely subjective. I mean, the person, um, uh, the individual will have their own kind of um, sense of what was standard and what was very and what mm. was quite. <laughs> and so this is open to question, but also open to question is the fact that at the higher levels the descriptions are very, very thin. Mm -hmm. um, and as a result, I do think that testers in particular need a much more detailed um, breakdown of descriptors. And in fact, I've just put one together oh, really? in this book that I've got coming out oh, there we are. this year. Okay. I mean, it's, it's still not very elaborate because I have simplified it so that people don't get sort of overwhelmed by sure. detail. But I do think we need to represent the fact that, as I say, above B1+, plus, people are capable of um, uh, tracing patterns of discourse, they're capable of making judgments about the speaker, they're capable of bringing in world knowledge which will um, shape their um, attitude to what's being said. All this kind of stuff they're capable of doing at um, B2 level and above, and that really needs to be better represented in the descriptors. In the descriptors, because the descriptors are often used as a basis for testing and assessment as well yeah. as syllabus yeah. design. Um, on the topic of testing of listening, um, it seems to me that the sort of things that you would argue against in terms of listening development could possibly be used in the assessment of listening, like the, the comprehension question. Would that be? Yeah, I mean, you know, if we are going to have to have comprehension questions, then I think what we need to do is to target them in ways that represent precisely the development of the learner. And we must be realistic about the kind of questions that we ask at lower levels. Uh, if they really are, and I've got masses of evidence that this is the case up to at least B1 and possibly beyond, if they really are very focused upon trying to recognise words and very small groups of words, 
then we mustn't expect them to be to have the, the spare working memory capacity mm. to also be thinking about the speaker's attitude um, and making inferences of things that the speaker's left unsaid, picking up on pragmatics, you know, um, um, things well, like uh, pe it. people saying, um, um, uh, isn't it a bit cold in here? <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> Would you please turn the fire on? Sure. You know, all this kind of stuff we can't expect them to do because they are very, very focused. All their efforts are focused at word level. And I think that um, uh, needs to be represented in testing and can be. And I've, I've developed a very, very sort of crude framework saying, well, let's test facts and mm -hmm. things up to about B1 level. Uh, let's try and restrict as much as possible what we do to facts. Uh, at the lowest levels, perhaps even have keys which are based upon simply recognising a word in connected speech mm. um, so that they can um, re relate this particular word to the question that was asked. And then at higher levels we can start asking. And it's here that in fact the tests are often very, very thin, interestingly. The tests designed for higher levels, what they do not do is ask about uh, what do you think the speaker's opinion is, um, what do you think the main point is, uh, how is this point in the line of argument connected with this other point in the line of argument? Um, even at um, CPE level, uh, but particularly, interesting, at CAE level, there is very little, uh, or at least I, I mean, I can only talk about samples that I've looked mm -hmm. at, but there was very little focus on the kinds of um, higher level skills that people need in order to make sense of a well-argued text or... Um, 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 a set of different points of view or something like that. Okay, well what about uh, moving away from teaching level to more a higher course design level or syllabus level? Um, I suppose what I'd like to ask is about skills syllabuses and where that sort of fits in with um, a lot of uh, discussion about different syllabus types. Um, we mentioned earlier on about synthetic, analytic, uh, that kind of thing. Um, do they fit into that scheme or is it something separate? Well. Sadly, I mean, I think this is a tradition that seems to have been lost. Um, um, in the, I'm old enough to, <laughs> well, it's not that long ago actually, I'm old enough to remember what was happening in the 1990s. On the back of communicative approaches, we had this new attitude to skills, which is connected with the notion of sub-skills, which was when people began to argue that if you divided um, uh, a skill into its component parts, you could then actually teach them progressively. So in other words, if you had some idea of what people were capable of doing at elementary level, you could limit, um, this relates very much to everything I've just said earlier, mm. you could limit what you did in the syllabus. Um, uh, we're not talking in terms of language, we're not talking about vocabulary or, or grammar, but in addition to that, you could limit what you did to what they are cognitively capable of doing at that stage. And a great deal of work was done, and again, um, you know, in reading, um, there were there were some um, Francois Goulet and, and one or two other people produced mm -hmm. very good books at the time, which were very influential. So a lot of work was done in relation to reading. Very little was done in relation to listening. Uh, I was experimenting with all this kind of stuff when I was working in Hong Kong, and I actually developed two levels of skills courses, which were developmental. And um, sadly, that seems to have gone nowhere. Mm. Um, well, and I'm very aware of the fact what they were great. for um, uh, the equivalent of A-level, I mean, for the two higher levels right. in, in Hong Kong schools. Because at the time, Hong Kong schools introduced a skills... This is, you know, skills was the buzz thing. Yeah. They introduced a skills-based test. Well, we take them for granted, sure. all the Cambridge tests and everything like that, but this was in a part of a school system. They had a, a skills-based test. They were a very, very enlightened exam mm. board at the time. And the teachers got very desperate because they had no idea how to teach skills. Mm. So the big challenge for me at that time was to design a skills program. It's actually a series of course books. I didn't mm. have any feed into the syllabus, but, but which would actually be progressive. And I did do that. And then about five years later, the teachers said, we're not giving them enough exam practice. <laughs> and about two or three years later than that, the publishers put pressure on me and said, could you convert this developmental skills course into an exam practice course? And that was the way things were going. Mm. And I do quite a lot of advisory work from time to time um, for publishers. 
And I'm very aware of the fact that when publishers try to produce skills courses, they have lost track with all this history. So I lost track of all this history. Um, Cambridge used to have some wonderful skills courses in the early 1990s, which I know people carried on using in private language schools and did mm -hmm. well into, well past the millennium. What kind of courses were they doing? I can't remember the name of the courses and I can't even remember the name of the series editor, but uh -huh. they actually had um, writing at four different levels, I think it was, reading at four different levels, speaking at four different levels, listening at four different levels, and mm -hmm. that was a very good model, but it didn't sell very well. <laughs> and so more. other people haven't uh, followed that through and there is a, 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 a very severe lack of anything which is designed to develop skills progressively these days and, and as I say when I, when I, when I advise publishers and when I, I get um, manuscripts that um, people have submitted I'm very aware of the fact that they have completely lost track of this um, whole idea of developmental skills and even of skills exercises based upon a, what used to be called a sub-skill and what I could now call a process. process yeah. That idea of progressively building, um, just to consider the nature of the texts used, be it in the written or, or a listening text, does that mean there has to be a lot of sort of cleaning up of uh, authentic uh, listening or that kind of thing or is it something else we're talking about? Well, I think w Let's leave aside authenticity for the moment, but I'm going to talk about that in a moment, if you like. Um, the, there, are, there are big issues. If, if you're trying to test somebody or to teach somebody um, in a particular skill, it, there are issues of um, the extent to which it relates to the real life experience. Um, and oh, this is where authenticity comes in, but it's also where um, um, the content of all texts comes in, whether they're scripted or not. Mm. I mean, they have to some extent to represent um, the kind of, even at a very low level, the kind of text that somebody might um, engage with in, in the real world. Um, <laughs> what we get very often is texts which are written to trap people. Mm. You know, they put little... Full of distractors. Um, or they're full of distractors. Yeah. Um, I mean, there is even an approach to authenticity where they say, hey, this is an authentic text, slightly rewritten. Mm -hmm. But when you look at the extent to which it is rewritten, you discover that it was a very simple text, which mm -hmm. was perfectly appropriate for, um, uh, um, uh, let's say, an elementary oh, no, no, learner. No. Yeah. And um, uh, that somebody has come along and put some descriptors in there to make it more difficult. You see this particularly in yeah. testing, but you also see it in teaching materials mm -hmm. as well, um, to try and trap them. Yeah, and that really is not what real world listening is about. Yeah. You know? um, uh, I, I think people are moving towards authenticity. I really hope they are moving towards authenticity, partly because of, of something I, I also mentioned to you, which is that one of the big problems we have nowadays is that it's extremely difficult to operate with CDs if you're trying to replay things in listening. And um, so more and more I think that some of the more informed teachers are turning towards the internet as a source, mm -hmm. and YouTube and things like that, as a source of materials, uh, which they can edit themselves. Yeah. They can take little clips out of them, but they are authentic materials of course. Mm -hmm. um, and this, I think, means that in some cases teachers are ahead of the materials that are available um, through publishers. Yeah. Um, publishers still go in for a great deal of um, rewriting of authentic materials, or at the very least scripting of authentic materials mm. and then re-recording them in the studios. And re-recording, there are two arguments for it, and the first argument is that always was that conditions were always better in a studio, and I don't think with the kind of facilities we have these days that that is true any longer. Hopefully not. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and, but the other, the, other, the other thing was that, that um, um, publishers have to get permissions. Yeah. And that's always been a block. It's been a block in testing. I mean, I'm talking particularly about listening, but sure. I mean, it's been a block to getting authentic material um, and it's been a block in testing as well as in teaching. But I do think that teachers, there's a whole new era dawning when teachers can exercise a greater degree of independence mm -hmm. than ever before in terms of listening materials. If they can download stuff from the internet, um, presumably you have to be a bit careful. You mm -hmm. know, theoretically, download it with permission, but, but stuff 
ideally which is labelled, <laughs> available, you can download stuff from the internet and you can edit it yourself. You can make it as long as, or as short as you like. And above all, in terms of listening, you can take out little clips sure. that you can focus on, just the kind of it's work that you're doing. You can take out little clips that you can focus on because they are complicated perceptually mm. and therefore they are blocks to understanding which derive from the skill and not from a knowledge of language, uh, not from a knowledge of vocabulary or grammar. Sure, exactly. So I think that um, uh, in years to come, I hope the teachers are going to be entertaining more and more initiatives in that direction. Let's hope so. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, this is the other thing that I wanted to say about the future of, uh -huh. of listening teaching. I think that the big problem that the listening teacher faces is the fact that you have a class of 10 or maybe 15 maybe 20, in some cases, if you're working in a state system, 30 people. Mm. It's all very well to play a recording to them, mm. to check their answers and to find that some of them got them right and some of them haven't got them right, and then perhaps to replay little bits of the recording that you think are causing the most problems. But the real problem underlying all of this is the fact that listeners are individuals. They develop in different ways, they focus on different things until they're guided, for example, with strategy training or whatever. They have a way of developing their own techniques for handling uncertainties in the text. And so within a class of 15, 20 or 30 people, you have a lot of individuals and you're trying to cope for the generality yeah. as a teacher. You're, trying, you're making your own assumptions, you know your students, you're making your assumptions about them. And um, it seems to me that what we're going to have to do in future is to um, pass the initiative to a much greater degree to the listener. And what this entails is firstly um, uh, making tape scripts available to people mm. so that after they have experienced this thing, or worked and worked and worked and in the class, they actually have a visible um, uh, record of what's happened to remind them of the bits that they found difficult and they didn't find difficult. Uh, but I think on top of that, we need to start setting listening homework, mm. where, again, you can download things from the internet, the students can download things from the internet, and they can work on them in their own time, at yeah. their own rate, and focusing on the bits that they find difficult. Well, this is much more easy now, I think, with mobile devices, and Precisely. people are doing it, and hopefully people are doing it more and more, but it's extremely People easy. aren't doing it more and more, I wish they were. <laughs> <laughs> they love the old listening lesson in the classroom, sure. you know, and there's a place for that. Uh -huh. but, but it is not actually going to deal with these individual problems, and I think the experience of an individual working at home, or indeed working in a, um, a listening centre, mm. um, where they've got as much time as they like to play and replay things, is, is, is the way in which we should be going. Um, because for some people, um, some people have um, problems of perception even at the level of, of the syllable. Mm. You know, other people have problems with matching words to words in their vocabulary. Other people have problems in storing words in their mind in order to try and find a kind of grammatical pattern in them. So they all have individual problems and if they can work on those individually, then they're inevitably going to improve much more working on their own, possibly than they do in class. Um, Very often I hear students who say they like to improve their listening and will just watch TV series. Uh, exactly, films. randomly. randomly <laughs> but they can't exactly rewind. Random. Well, yeah. They can't rewind. They, they, and they, they can, depending on who they're watching with, I suppose, <laughs> <laughs> is, is the answer. Yeah, yeah. Maybe some sort of guidance towards uh, exercises they can do on their own might be helpful, uh, as well as, oh, well, in fact, yes, setting well, some And, 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 and uh, you know, there's absolutely no reason. Well, there, are, there have been one or two. Uh, projects, very interesting projects, which uh, uh, have focused on this kind of thing, including the kind of work that you're doing. Um, there was a big project in France um, to try and equip universities with recordings, um, uh, where um, this was basically practice and sort of pre-sessional mm. um, courses, but um, with recordings where people could play the recording, tag something mm -hmm. that they hadn't understood go back and just replay the bits that they tagged and then long term they were hoping to link to those tags a number of examples of a similar, similar. kind of um, problem. problem. So in other words, if yeah. you've got something like elision where, mm -hmm. where words are getting the, the ends of the words are getting elided, yeah. you could actually give them four or five examples of elision taken from other sources and they could go straight from the problem to other examples of the problem 
And so they're actually hearing it in different voices, at different speech rates and everything. Mm. So the problem is being dealt with from all possible angles and uh, before they move on to another bit that they found. But again, this, this, the whole idea of this was to target individually. Yeah. So that if you had no problem with it, you could move on. <laughs> uh -huh. Whereas somebody who did could tag it. And, go back and I thought that's, that's one of the most exciting projects. It, I mean, it's taking a very, very long time. and I'm not sure where it's going at the moment, but, mm. but um, that's one of the more exciting projects that people have had. Sounds I think lovely, probably lovely. that's the way ahead. If we could only have the time and the resources and the funding to develop that kind of thing, I think it would be an enormously beneficial thing for, for, for learners in years to come. Thank you very much, Tom. It's uh, been, been a pleasure, uh, very interesting, uh, and hopefully quite useful. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thanks for asking me. <laughs>